Dolphin, ages 4 through 8, to be dismissed to Children's Church. Children ages 4 through 8, this time for separate activities for your age group, if you'd like to participate in that. As always, thank you to the many volunteers who work in our children's ministries, our youth ministries, and all the ministries of the church. While they're making their way down to their classroom, I invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9, the Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah being the first of what we call the major prophets in the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 9. This group of children is a little bit quieter than they normally are. Is that what it was? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Appreciate the honesty of a, of a parent there. <laughs> but a little bit more subdued than normal. I, I take it as a positive sign. They were really hoping to stay around here in their prayer preach today. Amen? Is that what they were looking for? Isaiah chapter 9. Youth group, where are y'all at today? Where, where's everybody at today? I was telling our director of missions' his wife how this place is normally filled up with the teenagers. Where, where are they at? Went to the pizza party. Oh, <laughs> Oh, we worship Dabo. Oh, we worship Dabo. Yeah. Is that what they're doing? Yeah. Well, I hope on their way they stop to worship Jesus Christ along the way. Amen? Amen? But, uh, yeah, we're down a little bit today. Isaiah chapter 9. That was the stall technique. I want all the choir members to get in here because they need to hear this today. Isaiah chapter 9. Verses 6 and 7 I mean, be one of our verses we look, or one of the passages of Scripture we look at today. If you'll be so kind and you're willing and able, stand on the reading of Scripture this morning. Hearing from God's Word and this God's house and this His day among these His people. Isaiah chapter 9. I'll be reading verses 6 and 7. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, your neighbor will share with you. Otherwise, there is also a, should be a copy of the Bible in the pew pockets that have you. From the New American Standard Bible. It reads, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Of course, I love the King James, for unto us, a child is born unto us, a son is given. And the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And again, reading that, that last title given to him, Prince of Peace, and then verse 7, beginning, for there be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. This morning as we continue to contemplate, again, the, the four sermons leading up to Christmas this year are each going to be on the themes around the, the Advent candle. As a, if you were here last week, we looked at Christmas being a season of hope. This week we look at Christmas being a season of peace. And we're going to explore what we mean by that. How is Christmas to be a season of peace? And indeed, if you've been watching the news in, in recent days, recent weeks, recent months, recent years, it's hard to contemplate peace here on earth with all that's going on, the devastation, the, 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 the violence, the, the senseless slaughtering of human lives and, and the, the destruction of families and all that's taking place in the world around us. I'm not talking just about ISIS. I'm talking about all the evil forces in the world out there today. But when we come to this, se this particular season, we think of Christmas and think about peace, where Jesus is proclaimed to be the Prince of Peace, of, of His government, there'll be no end, and, 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 uh, and it'll be a government of peace. Well, what is that? Has that been seen yet? It has not yet, but we will see it in Jesus Christ. Amen? Like we said earlier, the Christmas season, we celebrate the first coming of Jesus in that manger, but now we also look forward to that second coming of Jesus, the first advent and the second, and that's what we really look forward to. 
And Jesus will ultimately bring about this season of peace. But in the meantime, how can we as Christians, how can we as believers, followers of Jesus Christ, those who proclaim Him as our Lord and Savior, those of us who have identified ourselves with the name of Christian, how can we in some measure, somehow, some way show the world what Jesus is, how He can bring peace, and how we can live lives of peace? And in that, I want us to contemplate a few passages today. Before we get to that, how many of y'all have ever heard of the Christmas truce of World War I? The Christmas truce of World War I. Well, I'm going to read you from a, a um, section of a website, actually called firstworldwar.com. Firstworldwar.com if you want to look this up. But it, read, it tells us about the Christmas truce of World War I. Imagine this. Picture yourself. You are standing up to your knees in the slime of a waterlogged trench. It is the evening of the 24th of December, 1914, and you are on the dreaded Western Front. Stooped over, you wade across to the firing step and take over the watch. Having exchanged pleasantries, your bleary-eyed and mud-spattered colleague shuffles off towards his dugout. Despite the horrors and the hardships, your morale is high, and you believe that in the new year, the nation's army will march towards a glorious victory. But for now, you stamp your feet in a vain attempt to keep warm. All is quiet when jovial voices call out from both friendly and enemy trenches. Then the men from both sides start singing carols and songs. Next come requests not to fire, and soon the unthinkable happens. You start to see the shadowy shapes of soldiers gathering together in no man's land, laughing, joking, and sharing gifts. Many have exchanged cigarettes, the lit ends of which burn brightly in the inky darkness. Plucking up your courage, you haul yourself up and out of the trench and walk towards the enemy. The meeting of enemies as friends in no man's land was experienced by hundreds, if not thousands, of men on the Western Front during Christmas 1914. Today, 101 years after it occurred, the event is seen as a shining, a shining episode of sanity from among the bloody chapters of World War I, a spontaneous effort by the lower ranks to create peace that could have blossomed were it not for the interference of generals and politicians. The reality of the Christmas truce, how, however, is a slightly less romantic and a more down-to-earth story. It was an organic affair that in some spots hardly re registered as a mention and in others left a profound impact upon those who took place. I know you can't see this well, but this is a map of the British sector of the Western Front in the Christmas of 1914 where much of this took place. This is the trenches where all of this occurred. Many accounts of this event were rushed, confused, or contradictory. Others, which were written down long after the event, are weighed down by hindsight. These difficulties aside, the true story is still strikingly, or striking precisely because of its ragtag nature, it is more human and therefore all the more potent. Months beforehand, millions of servicemen, reservists, and volunteers from all over the continent of, of Europe had rushed enthusiastically to the banners of war. The atmosphere of the beginning of war was more of a holiday sensation than of conflict because they thought it would be soon over. But it was not long before the jovial facade was torn away. Armies equipped with repeating rifles, machine guns, and a vast array of artillery tore chunks out of each other, and thousands upon thousands of men perished. To protect against the threat of this vast firepower, the soldiers were ordered to dig in, to prepare for the next year's offensives, which most men believed would break the deadlock and deliver victory. The early trenches 
were often hasty creations and poorly constructed, as ones you see here on the screen. If the trench was badly sighted, it could become a sniping hot spot. In bad weather, which the winter of 1914 was a bad year, the positions could flood and the trenches could fall in. The soldiers, who were unequipped to face the rigors of the cold and rain, found themselves wallowing in a freezing mire of mud and the decaying bodies of their fallen comrades. The man at the front line could not help but have a degree of sympathy for his opponents who were having just as miserable a time as he was. Another factor that broke down the animosity between the opposing forces was the surroundings. In 1914, still early enough in the war, the men at the front could still see the, the vestiges of civilization in the near distance. Villages, although they were sometimes badly smashed up, were still standing. Fields, although they were pitted with shell holes, had not been turned into muddy lunarscapes as of yet. Thus, the other world, the civilian world, and the social mores and manners that went with it was still present at the front lines. Also lacking was the pain, misery, and hatred that years of bloody warfare would build up. Then there was the desire on all sides, on every side of every enemy, to see the, their opponent up close. Was he really as bad as the politicians, the papers, and the priests said he was? It was a combination of these factors and many more minor factors that made the Christmas truce of 1914 possible. On the eve of the truce, the British Army, which was still at that point a relatively small presence on the Western Front, was manning a stretch of the line running south from the infamous Ypres, salient for 27 miles down to the Labasi Canal, I believe it's how it's pronounced. Among the front, the enemy was sometimes no more than 70 yards, 50 yards, or in some cases only even 30 yards away. British here, 30 yards away in another trench were the Germans. Both Tommy, as the Brits were known, and Fritz, as the Germans were referred to, could quite easily hurl greetings and insults to one another. And importantly, they could come to tacit agreements not to fire. Incidents of temporary truces and outright fraternization were more common at this stage in the war, early in the war, than many people today realize. Even units that had just taken part in a series of futile and costly assaults were still willing to talk and come to arrangements with their opponents. As Christmas approached, the festive mood and the desire for a lull in the fighting increased as parcels arrived that were packed with goodies from home. On top of this came gifts that were care of the state. Tommy, the Brits, oftentimes received plum puddings and what was known as Princess Mary boxes. That was a little small metal case that was engraved with an outline of George V's daughter, and it was filled with chocolates and butterscotch, cigarettes and tobacco, a picture card of Princess Mary, and a facsimile of, of King George V's greeting to the troops, where he said, May God protect you and bring you home safe. Not to be outdone, Fritz, the Germans, received a present from the Kaiser. It was called a Kaiserlich, a, a large Meerschaum pipe for the troops and a box of cigars for the NCOs, non-commissioned officers, and the commissioned officers. Towns, villages, and cities, and numerous support associations on both sides also flooded the front lines with gifts of food, warm clothes, and letter of thanks. Letters of thanks, I should say. The Belgians and the French, they were there also. They also received gifts, although not in such an organized fashion as the British or the Germans. For these nations, though, the Christmas of 1914 was tinged with sadness because their countries were occupied. It's no, longer that the, it's no wonder that the truce, although it sprung up in some spots on French and Belgian lines, never really caught hold as it did in the British sector. With their morale boosted by messages of thanks and their bellies fuller than normal, and with still so much Christmas booty to hand, the, the season of goodwill entered the trenches. A British Daily Telegraph newspaper correspondent wrote that on one part 
of the line, the Germans had managed to slip a chocolate cake into the British trenches. Even more amazingly, it was accompanied with a message asking for a ceasefire later that evening so they could celebrate the festive season as well as their captain's birthday. They proposed a concert at 7.30 p.m. when candles, the British were told, would be placed on the parapets of their trenches. The British accepted the invitation and offered some tobacco as a return present. That evening at the stated time, German heads suddenly popped up and started to sing. Each number ended with a round of applause from both sides. The Germans then asked the British to join in. But at this point, one very mean-spirited British soldier shouted, We'd rather die than sing German. To which a German soldier joked aloud, If you sang, it'd probably kill us too. December 24th was a good day weather-wise. The rain had given way to clear skies. On many stretches of the front, the crack of rifles and the dull thud of shells plowing into the ground continued, but at a far lighter level than normal. In other sectors, there was an unnerving silence that was broken by the singing and the shouting drifting over from the German trenches. Along many parts of the line, the truce was spurred on with the arrival of the German trenches of miniature Christmas trees, Tannenbaum. The sight of these small pines, decorated with candles, and strung along the German parapets, captured the Tommies' imagination, as well as the men of the Indian Corps who were reminded of the sacred Hindu festival of light. It was the perfect excuse for the opponents to start shouting to one another, to start singing, and in some areas to pl pluck up the courage to meet one another in no man's land. By now, the British High Command, a command, by the way, that was comfortably what they called entrenched in a luxurious chateau 27 miles behind the front, they were beginning to hear the fraternization. Stern orders were issued by the commander of the British, Sir John French, against such behavior. Other brass hats, as the Tommies nicknamed their high-ranking officers and generals, also made grave pronouncements on the dangers and the consequences of parleying with the Germans. However, there were many high-ranking officers who took a surprisingly relaxed view of the situation. If anything, they believed it would at least offer their men an opportunity to strengthen their trenches. This mixed stance meant that very few officers and men involved in the Christmas truce were disciplined. Interestingly, the German high command's ambivalent attitude towards the truce mirrored that of the British. So this was really a, a foot soldier's truce, if you would. Christmas Day began quietly, but once the sun was up, the fraternization began. Again, songs were sung and rations thrown to one another. It was not long before troops and officers started to take matters into their own hands and ventured forth. No man's land, the land between the trenches, became something of a playground. Men exchanged gifts and buttons. In one or two places, soldiers who had been barbers in civilian times gave free haircuts. One German, who was a juggler and a showman, gave an impromptu and, given the circumstances, somewhat surreal performance of his routine in the center of no man's land. Captain Sir Edward Hulse of the Scots Guards, in his famous account, remembered the approach of four unarmed Germans at 8.30 in the morning. He went out to meet them with one of his ensigns. Their spokesman, he wrote, started off by saying that he thought it only right to come over and wish us a happy Christmas and trusted us implicitly to keep the truce. He came from Suffolk where he had left his best girl on a three and a half horsepower motorbike, he says. Having raced off to file a report at headquarters, Captain Hulse returned at 10 o'clock in the morning to find crowds of British soldiers and Germans out together chatting and larking about in no man's land in direct contradiction to his orders. Not that he seemed to care about the, the fraternization in itself, the need to be seen to follow orders was his concern. Thus he sought out a German officer and arranged for both sides to return to their lines. 
While this was going on, he still managed to keep his ears and eyes open to the fantastic events that were unfolding. Scots and Huns were, were fraternizing in the most genuine possible manner. Every sort of souvenir was exchanged, addresses given and received, photos of family shown, etc. One of our fellows offered a German a cigarette. The German asked, is that a Virginian cigarette? Our fellow said, aye, straight cut. The German said, no thanks, I only smoke Turkish. It gave us all a good laugh. Captain Hulse's account was in part of a letter to his mother, who in turn sent it on to the newspapers for publication as was the custom of the time. Tragically, he was killed a few months later, in March of 1915. On many, parts the line, uh, on many parts of the line, the Christmas Day truce was initiated through sadder means. Both sides saw the lull as a chance to get into no man's land, to seek out the bodies of their compatriots, and to give them a decent burial. Once this was done, the opponents would inevitably begin to talk to one another. The 6th Gordon Highlanders, for example, organized a burial truce with the enemy. After the gruesome task of laying friends and comrades to rest was complete, the fraternization began. With the truce in full swing up and down the line, there were a number of recorded games of soccer, although these were really just kickabouts rather than a structured match. On January 1st, 1915, the London Times published a letter from a major in the medical corps reporting that in his sector, the British actually played an organized game against the Germans, and, but they were beaten 3-2. to two. Kirk Zymish of the 134th Saxons recorded in his diary, he writes these words. <coughs> Pardon me. The English brought a soccer ball from the trenches, and pretty soon a lively game ensued. How marvelously wonderful, yet how strange it was. The English officers felt the same way about it. Thus Christmas, the celebration of love, managed to bring mortal enemies together as friends for a time. The truce lasted all day. In places it ended that night, but on other sections of the line it held over Boxing Day, which is the day after Christmas, and in some areas a few days more. In fact, there were parts on the front, front line where the absence of aggressive behavior was conspicuous well into the next year. Captain J.C. Dunn, the medical officer in the Royal Welch Fusiliers, whose unit had fraternized and received two barrels of beer from the Saxon troops uh, uh, on the other side, recorded how hostilities restarted on his section of the front. <clears throat> he writes this in his diary. At 8.30 in the morning, I fired three shots in the air and put up a flag with Merry Christmas on it, and I climbed on the parapet. He, the German officer, put up a sheet with thank you on it, and the German captain appeared on the parapet. We both bowed and saluted and got down into our respective trenches. He fired two shots in the air, and the war was on again. The war was indeed on again, for the truce had no hope of being maintained. Despite being wildly reported in Britain and to a lesser extent in Germany, the troops and the populations of both countries were still keen to prosecute the conflict. Today, pragmatists read the truce as nothing more than a blip, a temporary lull induced by the season of goodwill but willingly exploited by both sides to better their defenses and to eye out one another's positions. Romantics, however, assert that the truce was an effort by normal men to bring about an end to the slaughter. In the public's mind, the facts have become irrevocably mythologized. And perhaps this is the most important legacy of the Christmas truce today. In our age of uncertainty, it is comforting to believe regardless of the real reasoning and motives, that soldiers and officers who are told to hate, who are told to loathe and kill, that they could still lower their guns and extend the hand of goodwill, peace, love, and Christmas cheer. End of story. Isn't that a beautiful account of what can happen in Christmas, a season of peace? What can happen in Christmas a season of peace. So this morning, I've got 
I believe it's five points. It is five points, and we'll go through these fairly briefly, but five points to make about how this can be a season of peace and the basis for it being a season of peace. And so for, during this Christmas season, let us each remember these things. And these, the outlines contained within the context of your bulletin, and there's also be prompts on the screen on when to write down the, the, the fill in the blanks if you would. But during this Christmas season, let us each remember that, number one, peace is desperately needed. Peace is desperately needed because of the fall of man into sin. Do I get an amen in the house? Peace is desperately needed because of the fall of man into sin. A few years back, according to a, a, a Canadian Army journal, some researchers looked back over the course of recorded history. Now, recorded history stretched back as far as roughly 3,600 years before Christ when we have some, some uh, 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 records which we can, can trust, if you would. So, but according to this article, which these research look back from 3,600 years before Christ, we're now 2,000 years after Christ. That's a period of, of over five and a half millennia, 5,600 years of recorded human history. Think about that, 5,600 years of recorded human history. Of that time, in the recorded human history, the researchers found that of 5,600 years of recorded human history, there are only 292 total years where there was no warfare. 200 in total, 292 years in which there were no warfare and the world experienced peace, if you would, in that regard. Less than 300 years of our recorded human history where there's been no type of conflict going on in the world. During this span of history, there have been over 14,500 recorded wars, large and small, in which a staggering 3.6 billion people have been killed. The world desperately needs peace. Amen? We need peace. We need peace, so how do we find peace? Where do we get peace? Who is going to deliver peace and secure peace? We know the answer to that, amen? Look back at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 again. For unto us a child will be born, unto us a son is given, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of... Prince of Peace. Who are we referring to here? Who's Isaiah talking about? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only one to give peace. I wish I'd have thought to put this on the, on the screen. You've seen the church marquees where it says, No Jesus, no peace, N-O Jesus, N-O peace, no Jesus, no peace. Counter that with no Jesus, K-N-O-W, Jesus, K-N-O-W, peace. So if there's no Jesus, there is no peace. But if you do know Jesus, you can know peace. Amen? Jesus is the one who delivers peace. Jesus is the promised prince of peace. Jesus is the one who came to deliver peace. Jesus is the one who one day will claim this world again unto himself and restore peace. Jesus is the answer to this world. The Democrats are not the answer. Praise God. The Republicans are not the answer. Praise God. Military might is not the answer. Though me and Ron, we like, to, we like to think of that sometimes, you know. But we know the real answer is Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who can secure peace. Until Jesus is embraced by the world, this world will never embrace peace. We must take Jesus to the world. We must take Jesus to the world. Point number two is God promised peace through the Messiah. God promised peace through the Messiah. He promised peace through Jesus Christ. He promised peace through Jesus Christ. God promised peace through that Messiah. And who is the Messiah? Jesus Christ is Jesus is the Messiah. Look at Luke chapter 2. In the New Testament, Luke chapter 2. The, fam the very familiar Christmas narrative we have there of the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. <coughs> Pardon me. 
Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and, and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. Amen? The world desperately needs peace. God says you can have peace, and I will give you peace through the Messiah. And as we see in Luke chapter 2 here and other passages, Jesus is that Messiah. He is the promised one, the anointed one, the very Son of God. Jesus is that Messiah. Well, the question is, how can a baby in a manger, how can a little infant child in such humble circumstances how, how can this child bring peace? How is it that a little babe in a stinky old barn, surrounded by all the, the very humble circumstances in which he lived, how can that child deliver peace? Well, Isaiah, among others, said, well, yeah, he's, he's going to be the Prince of Peace. And he's going to be the Messiah. And he's the one that would deliver. But Isaiah also said some things in Isaiah chapter 53, did he not? About this Messiah. Turn back to Isaiah 53 in the Old Testament. No, you feel like you're in a Bible drill today. That's okay, amen? Isaiah 53. We'll just read the first five, five verses of this chapter. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the Lord been revealed? Or whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Verse 5, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The, ch the chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. You could also say the chastening for our peace fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. That last part of verse 5, the chastening for our peace fell upon Him. And by His scourging, we are healed. The world desperately needs peace. God promises peace through the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah, but how can that little babe, how can that Messiah bring us peace? Well, we see there in Isaiah 53, proven in the New Testament in the Gospel narratives, Jesus brings us peace through His suffering. Amen? Jesus brings us peace through His suffering. Through His suffering. 
Because He endured the cross, the physical agony of death on the cross, because He enabled us to experience eternal life through faith in Him by being cleansed of His blood, we can have that eternal peace. Amen? Does that mean that everything in this world is going to be peaceful day in and day out? No, it does not. We know that. We've experienced that. We see it on the news. Many of us in our church families have experienced that personally where, where peace, like we envision peace, does not come. But we have the peace of knowing that we have an eternal hope in Jesus Christ. We have that eternal, that, 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 that given promise to us that we will be part of His family, His inheritance, His, His kingdom. That if we have Jesus in our lives, nothing can change that. We will have peace. Amen? We may endure for a season, but there will come a day when we'll experience that peace firsthand. And, for, and when, if the Lord comes back tomorrow and we experience that, we will see peace that only Jesus can deliver. Jesus brings us peace through His suffering. Through His suffering. And point number five, the final point, comes out of Revelation. Jesus will reign eternally in a kingdom that has peace with no end. Jesus will reign eternally in a kingdom that has peace with no end. Look at the, the very back of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and He will dwell among them, and they shall be His people, and God Himself will be among them, and He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And He who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Jesus, Jesus is the one who will bring peace. The question is, that, well, Ray, that talks about the future. That talks about the future. How can I experience that peace today? How can I have that satisfaction of knowing that regardless of what I face today, Jesus has me in His hand. I'll be eternally secure. Go back to that first night. That Christmas night. We read about it in Luke chapter 2 a minute ago. In Luke chapter 2, we see the story about how Joseph and Mary, who is great with child, I believe is how the King James phrased it, how they were to travel down for the census. They were going down to the city where Joseph's ancestors came from. His little lineage of David. They had to travel down to Bethlehem to register for the census. And while there, she gave birth in very humble circumstances because there's no room for them in the inn. And then the shepherds in the field, other men in lowly circumstances, these shepherds... Uh, some of the lowest in society are considered to be dirty in many ways because they, they're the ones that tended to the sheep and the lambs and they were out in the fields and, and it was a, a low rung of society, if you would. And, and you think if God's going to announce the, the bringing of His Son, the, the birth of His Son, he, He'd announce it through the, 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 those who were, had high stature in the world, those who were of, of political fame or of, of great riches, those who had influenced the community. But he brought it to the little shepherds. And he sent an angel. And they were scared. And he says, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Which will be for all people. You included. You included. For today in the city of David has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And he said, there will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby who's going to be wrapped in cloths. going to be laying in a manger. And then suddenly there appeared with the angel... A multitude of the heavenly hosts, angels from heaven, covering the expanse of the skies. Terry, wouldn't you love to lead a choir like that? Amen? You know, just covering the expanse of the evening skies. And I can just, just picture the, these lovely shepherds, or anybody for that matter, who had witnessed that in the air. 
And just the fear and the awe that would come over them. It would be a mixture between being terrified and just, and just worshiping God because you're in the presence of some of what the glory that He's revealed and that wonderful picture in the air. And that multitude sang a song. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among men with whom He is pleased. Now if you have the King James Version, it says something like this, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Now leaves it at that. Now King James is a pretty good translation of the Bible. Don't get me wrong. And if you, if you prefer the King James, don't take this as a criticism by any means. But that translation is only partially accurate. Partially correct. The better translations, the more accurate translations, say something along the lines of what the New American Standard says. Peace among men with whom he is pleased or on whom his favor rests. Well, if I want to experience the peace that God promises through Jesus, I can't experience that if I'm not pleasing to God. If his favor is not resting on me, well, young folks, how is it that we please God? What's the best way to please God? What's really the only way to please God? It's to honor His Son. To accept His Son. He sent His Son, His only begotten Son, Jesus, to die on that cross so that we could live. And the only way I can please God is to accept that gift to accept Jesus Christ, to worship Jesus as Lord and Savior. If I want to experience peace, I cannot do it unless I have Jesus in my heart. Unless I choose to believe in Him, choose to follow Him, choose to be one of His children. Pray to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If I want peace, it must come through Jesus. It's a choice that I have to make. It's a choice that we all have to make. Nobody can make it for us. Nobody can choose for us to follow Jesus. Rick's the head of his household, but he can't choose Jesus for Wendy or Rachel or Kayla or Zach. They've got to choose it for themselves. I'm the head of my household, though Robin might disagree. You know? <laughs> I can't choose Jesus for, for Robin. I know I've just confused some of y'all by calling her by a name. What do we know her by? Baby girl, that's right. I can't choose Jesus for baby girl or for Jonathan or Michael. They must choose Him for themselves. Just because you're a part of Buffalo Baptist Church, you may have been a member here all your life. You may have been baptized in that baptistry back there or in the creek several years before that. It doesn't matter if you're a member of a church alone. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, you are not pleasing to God and you will never experience that peace that only He can bring. Amen? We must have Jesus. Jesus is why we celebrate Christmas. Jesus is why we have hope. Jesus is through whom we have peace. It all begins and ends with Jesus. Amen? So this morning, this morning, you want to live in this world and know that you have eternal peace? It's up to you. Will you choose to follow Jesus? Marsha, if you come on and play. Terry, if you prepare to lead us, I'm going to ask that you just bow your head with me. Close your eyes. Nobody's looking but me. Even I'm not looking. Right now, the only person can see is the Lord Himself. As He examines what's going on in this room, and while He and us examine,